Hey all, it is uh, 6.58 a.m. Central Standard Time on April the 14th, or according to the calendar that I'm using, it would be the day of Rashid, or first fruits. I've explained to you in the past why I've chosen the Sabbath day I've chosen, okay? I'm not saying I'm right. Um, but then again, I'm not saying the Saturday people are right either. Um, I'm not saying I'm right by observing the weekly Sabbath and daylight hours. However, there are passages that have led me to at least know that I, I would have to do a lot more in-depth study to absolutely determine the weekly Sabbath is evening to evening. Now, obviously the uh, the Kadush Mikra within the feasts those are evening to evening they're specifically um, cited as an evening to evening observation um, I wanted to just make this it's not necessarily part of the series that I did on on the Sabbath but so according to uh, how I'm observing when I've figured out um, the times when one would determine uh, when the spring is when the fall is when months start and how to count from there and the fact that I, I've had to choose what day I, I would see as best okay for the weekly Sabbath and then I had to uh, really um, extract the information on uh, first fruits or Rashid mostly from the New Testament and there are some assumptions to it the thing is all right it just would appear that there's overwhelming evidence for it being because it's definitely the day after a Sabbath that's in the text in the Old Testament we can see that for sure what I would say is that there's just overwhelming evidence that it is within it is within the the feast of Matsut. For one thing, it's because Yahweh says in other passages that Israel was to appear before him three times in a year. Okay, so one time would be at the end of the year, one time the middle of the year. Uh, and we're t I'm talking about basically the planting to harvest season, okay, so spring to fall. And that middle uh, time would be uh, Shabbat or Pentecost, and then the early part of the year. Now, I could be incorrect, and here's one of the things, and I haven't gotten to do a close study yet of the feasts that happen at the end of the year because there are two that are spanned between um, nine days I believe because I think there's an end cap on a seven day period and then the thing is there's uh, like within a week or so after that there is a week of Tabernacles, it's Sukkot, booths. You're actually, you're actually building a small temporary structure to dwell in. Now, I don't believe that that is uh, one of those you have to be in a certain location dictates. I will take a closer look at it, but I'm pretty sure it's just the, uh, the latter feast, which would be uh, trumpets. And, um, oh goodness. Well, I know that uh, the Jews call it Yom Kippur, but I would have to say that I'm not 100% sure what it actually should be called uh, biblically. So let's just see. Here we go. Yep. Yom Kippur. That's the Day of Atonement, and then before that, it 
It's a memorial of trumpets. So let's see. You shall have Shabbatun, Zacharun, so in memory, and then it's, uh, now it's not Karanut, it's actually Teroa, which I haven't done a word study on. Funny thing is, they say right off the bat that it's a, a battle cry, Tar. Hmm. Tar usually having to do with um, the edge, sometimes even the silhouette of a person. Now, it's oftentimes with a an A ah or A between the uh, Ta and the air. But sometimes, like with the uh, the verb form of it or action, Yitar, it still points to the same sort of thing. Uh, so anyways, I won't get too far off in that, but because it would appear that those days, um, Atonement, Yom Kippur, that's one time block that you would go to the appointed place. And Shabbat or Pentecost would be a time you would go to an appointed place. And then early on, Pasa and Matsut would be when you would go to an appointed place. Yes, tabernacles is is separate from um atonement and uh and trumpets. Uh it's about a week after that's done. But here's the thing on um well let's just look. Booths or tabernacles seven days offer an offering by fire. The eighth day shall be a holy convocation made by fire. See, this is one of the things with the uh, the fire because I ran into this too, in within the context of matzut and first fruits. Um, this offering by fire. Now, here in. So you remember there was the uh, the verses about not being able to make offerings or do any of these things or even build a uh, mazaba or a, an altar within your own gates. You, you had to go to appointed places. Um, if there were offerings here, you would think the same thing. But... In Leviticus 23, anyways, besides all your vows, all your freewill offerings, 15th day in the 7th month, and you're going to get, well, they translate it as, as boughs of goodly trees and palm trees and thick trees. Um, from what I've seen, without an exhaustive study, it would appear that we're just talking about lumber. You would put this together with lumber. But there's no actual items specified, as in making an offering as we would currently perceive offerings. And there's a lot of different words that are translated similarly as far as offerings and sacrifices and presents and so on and so forth. So it still appears that there are only three times that you're expected to go to whatever place it is that Yahweh appoints. And one of those times certainly seems to be the Pesah Matsut time, which would make all the sense in the world if Rashid or First Fruits was the day after the weekly Sabbath within that seven-day block. When I say seven-day block, I mean the days of Matsut. There is one day that is Pasa that happens before Matsut, so you might see it as eight days. In the New Testament, and this is very unfortunate because it makes things a bit confusing, the terms um, for Passover and unleavened bread are actually very much, um, <laughs> I don't want to say intertwined, they're used interchangeably. And it does make things confusing when you read this. Um, I can't imagine that it w would have been the authors that wrote it that uh, were intentionally uh, doing that 
or if there was a more uh, temporal or colloquial understanding, you know, ways that they referred to it as in that day and that time, and the authors were simply using those um, those current terms. That's a possibility. So, I'm saying because of when you show would have rose from the dead, that um, there's just overwhelming evidence that first fruits would be within those days of Matsut, on the day after the weekly Sabbath. Um, yeah, I did want to address the fact that it was right after I made the third video on Passah that I was reading in Deuteronomy, checking some things for other other work that I do, and I came across Deuteronomy 14, and it reminded me, because it within the first few verses, it's talking again about the people and eating of abominable things. Now, I did double-check the underlying text. It is quite possible that it is talking about a standard rule of eating. So, I definitely concede that there is, uh, there is enough, um, there is enough compelling evidence that that would be a blanket, um, command. Not just something for, uh, offerings. I'm not saying I believe that to be a fact or proven or concrete. But I believe there is compelling evidence, which means that not only do the passages which um, determine these things, not only do they need to be compared and gone over and translated, but again, um, not only do the specific animals uh, that are being talked about need to be determined, like word studies need to be done on them, but also descriptives, because like, for instance, in Leviticus 11, I'm pretty sure it's the same in Deuteronomy 14. In English, in our translations, there are descriptions that describe um, clean animals as far as mammals go, being an animal with a split hoof that chews its cud. The wording within those passages is... I don't know if I want to say dubious... You see, the words used, the, the verbiage, and um, the attributive words are words that are actually extremely common in other sorts of usage. And because they're so common in other sorts of usage, it can be a little bit tough to determine that what's being said there, because it's the passages oftentimes, and for anybody who has started to look at Hebrew, um, and, and unfortunately, when you look at Hebrew, you're going to have to look at it as Hebrew. And then if you have um, my Obrey concordant list from Strong's, you can look at the glyphs, which when I come out with my uh, my fourth Obrey, uh, Obrey 4, because right now it's beta 3 that I'm using on all these, there will be some changes to the look of the glyphs. That Not a lot, though. You'll get a pretty good idea of what they should have originally looked like from that. The only changes are going to be is a little bit in orientation and the shape of some of them to look far, far more like our Germanic English alphabets uh, today. Not because <clears throat> I'm trying to get them to look more like that, but simply because it makes a whole lot of sense having them look more like that, because um, even the letters that we use today bear such an amazing resemblance to them. So, if you were to read these passages and what... Uh, Hebrew translations you had available, and you were to start to understand what these 
uh, Hebrew letters look like as Obery glyphs. And then started understanding that most of these words are based on common roots, those roots of which are used as verbs, as nouns, and as attributives, attributes. Then what you'll end up seeing, and this makes things kind of tough because if somebody wrote a dictionary like this, um, there would be a great amount of criticism from uh, textual critics or literary critics. You will see words that are used as a noun and a verb back to back with one another. And because uh, the current dictates Concerning prefix, prefixes, suffixes, and affixed glyphs, so ones that appear within uh, a root, because of the current rules that there are, there are many instances in which, let's say, a noun or an attribute could bear the same prefixes, suffixes, or affixes as a verb. Now, the reason that I'm going that far into explaining that is to explain to you why I would say some of the things that I do. I don't do it to cause confusion or doubt or, or anything else. I do that to try to illustrate that there are, there are passages, there, there are instances of wording that they're tricky. And so I'm not making an absolute determination on them until I have time to work with them. Um, the, one of the hardest things about this is because I've had to, out of necessity, work predominantly in the area of nouns. Because that's just been the, uh, it, it's been the easiest uh, area to work in. If it, let's just say you broke this down into three basic categories of noun, verb, and attribute. The reason being is because since I'm I I see that the language is mostly made up of words that have the ability to phase between um, those different forms. Nouns seem to be one of the easiest. Um, Oftentimes it's true that, that you're going to get concretes based on verb too, but not as often as noun. It's much easier to identify a thing, oftentimes, um, than an action. And when you look at the fact that an action, if it's also represented in, in other places as a thing or, or an attribute, especially a thing or a noun, then it's likely that it's based on something concrete. Even if it's something abstract like love, to love somebody as a verb love, it still should be based on something concrete. So that's why I've mostly concentrated on nouns. Now, what's really great is somebody uh, joined the, um, the, the, the Obery Discord um, that Nathan set up, and he had been uh, looking at getting to know and developing a software that can actually run tests on verb conjugations, which is really great. Um, one of the reasons is because in Hebrew, their rules for conjugating the verb are well, let's just say, in my opinion, they don't have even the sort of logical consistency that, that English does. Um, and I'm not saying that English is a consistent or logical language, but I'm just talking about the basic rules for conjugating a verb when applied to English. Uh, the other thing is, and uh, you could find this out, if you get any decent resource that explains uh, the verb system and uh, and conjugating the verb in Hebrew, 
you're going to notice that as much as the authors of these things don't want to admit it, there are all of these areas of inconsistency in their application of rules. Moreover, when you go to the text to apply those rules, you're going to find so many passages within the text that don't even that don't even bear out um, the specific rules they have for conjugating verbs. It's ridiculous, and it is very complex. And as complex as you may see, the uh, even just the introduction to conjugating verbs in Hebrew to be, it gets more complex from there. Um, and the, the, the reason for the complexity, for one thing, is because of the inconsistency and the rules that have to be um, contrived to make up for those inconsistencies, to sort of try to explain away those inconsistencies. Now, <clears throat> it would be much easier uh, for this gentleman who is designing this software to test conjugations in Hebrew grammar, if he was able to test those in, you know, pure documents uh, made up predominantly of Obri text. Um, now, I've started actually just writing out from really just the standard Masoretic text. Let's, let's just say that the King James Old Testament was based on from standard Masoretic text writing out um, the books of the Bible. And um, I had somebody who I was working with um, on some of these language and other issues that had actually written uh, a Genesis out in that way, but um, they are no longer available. Anyone who would be interested in in chipping in, in, in helping out in the pursuit of understanding that pure language that as according to Zephaniah 9.13, Yahweh is going to give to us in the latter days. A pure, he's going to restore to us a pure language. If you want to chip in, all you need to do is you would download LibreOffice onto your computer, which it is uh, open source, so it is completely free. They just ask for donations if you can, and it's worth it too because they are great programs, LibreOffice. Very powerful, very good programs. And I already have various documents set up. I have the formats set up. Um, all it would be is a matter of like fill in the blank. Basically copying verses from a, a Hebrew text and bringing them into LibreOffice in your document just because it's easier to look at them um, unless you were somebody who was going to commit to do this then you could you could probably buy a manuscript that is the, the just the general Masoretic manuscript it what the King James was written from because there's a couple of Masoretic so basically if you got a, a I think if you got a um, a contemporary BHS, Biblia Hebraica uh, Stukertensia, then, then that should harmonize with it. What we just need is, and this doesn't have to be perfect because there are some variations in some Hebrew texts that are out there, but we need one, one consistent um, Hebrew text that we're working from. Um, so far, I've been working from the HSB4 module um, in, uh, in e ESORD. And the reason is, is because this matches up chapter and verse exactly as the King James. As I've said so many times in the past, it's not because I'm absolutely in love with the King James. It's because currently um, one of the best systems we have of, of searching for, finding, and logging words and terms and so on and so forth is with the King James Version of the Bible and the Strong's Concordance. It's just a fact. 
Um, it's not a fun fact, but it's it's fact. So please, if you have the time, and I bet a lot of you have a lot more time now than you did, and even when you go back to work, I'm sure you still have enough time. I'm, I'm sure you could give up a little bit of your Netflix time or something, and you have that desire to not be a, just a taker, but somebody who uh, actually participates and and throws uh, their chips in too with everybody and says, I'm going to do something um, to help to help advance the kingdom and our cause, the cause of truth and goodness, then just contact me. I'm easy to contact. You can contact me at the Obery Project with a K dot info and there's a contact page. You can send me an email. Absolutely. I'll get you going. It's not super mind-numbingly hard stuff. It's relatively pretty darn straightforward. And if you type, most of the keys that you're using to type with are the same as in English. There's only a couple of them that are different because they had to be because there's about three glyphs in Obri that don't have a direct English equivalent. That's it. So, um, yeah, if he had that and other people that are trying to, to do work, even if I did, because there's a lot of times I would like to run root tests within documents. And the only way to do that is either try to run them in existing Hebrew documents, which of course are all orientated differently. They're all orientated from right to left, and they're not going to run a lot of those documents, the same kind of word searches that you could run in a document that is set up for the way that we read and write in English today, which is left to right. That's the other thing about Obri. It is all orientated for left to right. Because, first off, I don't think that it matters. I've seen so many old texts, fragments of old texts, so on and so forth, that are written left to right orientation, right to left orientation, left to right on one line, right to left on the next, left to right on the next, and so on. In all manner of orientation, when you think about it, it almost doesn't matter what direction a text goes in. It, let's say English. You're an English speaker. It almost doesn't matter. You'd be able to look at it and read it. So it, it's the fact that putting it in a software that is is working in the um, the formats that we work in, which is a left to right sort of format and the fact that I'm able to uh, overlay the uh, Obri Beta 3 font um, onto the keyboard. You don't have to use a special keyboard. You don't have to use a special um, um, special font or coding. Most of it is so very close to English with the exception of of really three letters and more like two. Um, the biggest difference is the tha is on the T key, all right? The ta is on the I key. The sha is on the W key. Um, and then the ta is on the X key. So I tried to even keep the look of these things um, as close as possible to the keys on the keyboard. All of the other keys are coded like a is coded to A and B coded to B and so on. All of the numbers work just like numbers do. When you create a font like this, every key that you don't use just works as as a general like generic font. Every key that isn't in use will come through if you hit it um, as something that looks very much like Century Gothic, basically. So not that hard. Um, all right, so at my home, the application of Matsut and Pasa. It was uh, it's interesting because it's the first year that we've attempted to uh, apply this. The meal was not difficult to prepare. Um, we really didn't know what to do with the bitter aspect of it, and I told you about that because there's just nothing that proves that it's herbs. It's just mararim, bitterness. So... I told you it's it's very possible because of mar um, used in modern uh, Latin derivative languages that it could mean salty or briny. 
which to tell you the truth, it could just mean bitter, and that's where mer came from. Um, that's why the oceans and seas are called mer, bitter. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to be salty or briny. Um, and I hope I know more from next year, but we did our best. And uh, we baked some matsut, and uh, I baked some again uh, on the, uh, the, the preparation day for the first uh, mikra, uh, kadush mikra for uh, matsut, the days of matsut. It turned out pretty good. I would suggest not using oil in your mix. And really all I did was use uh, oil and salt. Um, what did I? I used a little sugar the second time I made Matsut. Anyways, I wouldn't recommend the oil in the mix. Because I think oil actually helps to, uh, to sort of toughen up the flour. I would actually use butter. Now, I already use animal fats as opposed to any kind of vegetable oil. Um, olive oil is one of the few oils that I look at as, as really not bad, but oil in general, um, I try not to use very much for cooking. Now, oil or shortening, not when I don't have to. Um, animal fats, butter, which mostly butter, and um, hopefully uh, we can start using some tallow for, uh, for cooking too, but um, even my pizza crust and... I'm from pizza people. My dad had a, a pizza place or two when I was, was little uh, for a while. But we had it as a family tradition all through the years. And we still do to this day. You know, every weekend we make pizza one of those days. And um, w without being, you know, egotistical, I'm pretty good in the, at it. The pizza is really good. So this time around, we weren't able to not, not make the regular crust. So what we decided to do was experiment, and we made a pie crust, which is predominantly flour and butter. And I thought it worked out all right. I mean, it wasn't, you know, what it normally is, but it wasn't bad, I'll tell you that. Um, that also uh, helped me consider all of the possibilities that you have for uh, things that you might want as snacks or treats during that time because you have to consider when you're looking at what is leaven basically yeast baking powder and baking soda are all leaveners anything that you would have with those things in them or those things themselves would have to go out of the house for that time period that so that includes cookies crackers because mostly those things with just a light rise to them, um, they're using baking soda for that light rise. Um, things with a bit more rise to them, various baked goods, they're oftentimes using baking powder. And then things with a lot of rise to them or things fermented, usually that's yeast. And that's why the alcohol goes out too, because I believe that it, anything alcoholics, the hametz, Part of it applies because I believe that that's specifically uh, referring to fermentation. So yeah, of course, beer and wine, um, but also the harder alcohols because even though it's distilled, it's distilled from something fermented. So we've done pretty good, and you know, um, to my wife's credit, she has tried to roll with this really well, and actually. Um, She's reminded me of like there were things that I hadn't even thought of that she thought of that would be good to put out. Um, I accidentally bought something at the store one day that had leaven in it, not even thinking of it, just not even thinking. And I got home and she had opened the door and she saw what was in the bag and she's like, oh, we can't have that in the house. And I said, ah, you're right. Didn't even think of it because why would you? Um, it's going to happen. You know, if you're going over seven days, there's, there's going to be times when you're not even going to think. I was at work on Saturday. I um, I deliver food for a restaurant on Saturdays. And um, for my meal, I got, um, they have a lasagna, right? And um, <clears throat> so noodles are fine. They don't have any leaven in noodles. And I didn't get it with the bread or anything, of course. And so after I had had that, 
A girl that works there had put some cookies her mom made on the back table. Me, not even thinking. Just not even thinking. Um, just picked one up and ate it. And I didn't even think anything of it at the time. Nothing. Just it. Okay. Wasn't a very good cookie. No offense. Um, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. And then I was telling my wife we were talking about cookies. Because usually she bakes things on down days and stuff. And she said that it stinks because she can't really bake anything she normally does. Um, and I was trying, I was going to tell her about these cookies that I didn't think were very good. And then I realized when I was telling her about it, I said, yeah, you know, I ate this one and then, oh, and then it hit me. Wait a minute. I ate a cookie. Oh my gosh. And then I just, oh, well, I, you know, I don't look at it as nothing, but we're getting used to it. There's going to be bumps you know, as you try to get used to things. And, you know, the funny thing is most of us don't live without leaven. So living without leaven and products that have leaven in them is an interesting thing to do for a week. Um, it's really surprising to see how much leaven is around us in how many things day to day, just in general, commonly. There's a lot. There's a lot, and there's there's lessons there to be learned in the symbolism of getting rid of leaven for that time. But that's, so that's how it's gone so far, and uh, I think it's good for first year, you know. Um, so besides for those things, I did have something that's really been bothering me, probably because I just start, not just, but I'm still on the first portion of the document I am putting together for the final episode of this season of the Bible in Obrey. This document is all on precious metals that we use as colors even to this day, <clears throat> and gemstones. And I'm still in the gold section because there's so many words that are translated as gold, which I thought was insane. I thought there would only be a couple, few, you know. But it got me thinking. It got me thinking because, you know, every time I look into any of this stuff, I try to gather as much information as I can, uh, no matter what it is, you know. When I was doing the reds for the Bible in Obrey, there was uh, the, the cochineal insect. And all the things I found about the, uh, about the cochineal, which were really, really interesting, and how um, how mostly... The cochineal, which is used to this day to make the most red dye in the world, period, hands down, and blue dyes, because if you uh, if you introduce very similar a uh, simple chemical process to this uh, this this cochineal matter that you would get from crushing uh, these uh, these little insects, uh, you can get a blue from that too. Um. I found out that, of course, most of them are uh, are raised uh, or found naturally. Now they're raised because of all the call for red dye, especially in food. And is that cochineal one thing that's considered clean to eat? Is that what has to do with the problems that people experience with red dyes? I know a lot of people that actually have allergic reaction when they eat too many foods with red dye in it. That red 40, which I'm almost 100% positive, is derived from the cochineal. Um, so you find out a lot of things, right? So I'm try I, you know, I've been trying to find out a lot about gold. And the value of gold and all of its uses... And, you know, if maybe it had more uses in the ancient world than it does today, because to be honest with you, today I would be really hard-pressed to invest in any kind of metal because they are all commodities that are controlled by the same people that control the fiat currency. Uh, really, all commodities, period. And the thing is, if you if you store up a lot of gold and they are able to manipulate that commodity. I mean, they were able to rob this entire country of all of its gold back in the 1930s. What makes you think that they can't um what makes you think that they can't uh 
adjust the market in such a way to make your gold worth far less than you had hoped it would be. So I don't know how much faith I would put in the value of that staying the same. Uh, plus, the Bible says that you shouldn't put your faith in riches, uh, whatever they may be. Uh, I don't think that gold is uh, amongst the more valuable of commodities. And uh, I'll explain why. And I'd like to ask a few questions about gold. And, you know, maybe you guys can chime in on what you think of gold and um and wealth and banking and the the just the establishment the commonplace story we're told about banking and gold and wealth and who's in power and how now before i even start posing some of my questions i do know that one of the factors that's going to make this difficult is that in the ancient world so the world of the bible and all of the other areas of the world that Noah's sons went to live in. Now, of course, my belief based on biblical material and what I can see today sociologically, I believe that they were all stretched between mostly, predominantly, North America, um, Northern Asia, and Europe for the most part those areas and maybe even more north of that uh, especially for those large expanses of time when it was in general warmer than it is today uh, I think in fact <clears throat> they probably used the northern seas uh, that we typically look at as as frozen and harder to pass I think they probably used them just very regularly and very commonly and that um, we are probably experiencing uh, a time of um, a lot more cold today, perhaps. But that aside, yeah, we don't know exactly the technologies that they had and that they utilized all during that time. You and I don't, is what I'm saying. Um, so we may not know just how how valuable let's say something like gold and silver was just as a common element in use using it for certain things technologies techniques um, I mean we already know that gold is a great conductor it's a really great conductor of energy and heat it's very malleable um, of course it preserves things that it's uh, if you wrap gold around something it's going to protect it, it's going to preserve it, it doesn't corrode, which is a really great feature of it too. Um, and you know, who knows, there, you know, there could be a lot, I mean besides its um, <clears throat> symbolic purity, there could be a lot of reasons why, for instance, the, uh, the whole Arun, or Ark, was um, absolutely covered in it and actually most of the vestments in the um, what they would call the Holy of Holies and um, and the room just outside of that everything gold 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 uh, and, and when you get further and further away from it you start seeing metals that would be considered more common than that at least as they're translated in the Bible like silver bronze um, Okay, but so that kind of unknown factor aside, if you had a kingdom, if you had a kingdom today, if you had a country that you were um, presiding over, I could see you wanting your country to... Uh, to deal with money, as far as money goes, uh, uh, an item that you use that represents something of greater value, and this is, of course, the thing that we need to start understanding when we look at anything happening today, anything that these, uh, you know, these people at the top, these Canaanites, these Edomites, uh, and what they're doing, we need to understand that, that gold 
precious metals, things like that. That's not where the value's at. It's all still, again, it's representations of greater value. Um, as far as I'm concerned, you know what's a much greater value than precious metals? is food and natural resources. Natural resources. Clean water. You know, it's something that they've sunk a heck of a lot of gold into, is trying to create... Uh, clean water and water purification systems and um, ways and means to to transfer a lot of clean water to the occupied areas of Palestine because even at their total 8 mil population between Jews and Arabs it is horrifically difficult to sustain that so clean water um, cattle various types of cattle for for work for uh, for leather for wool um, for food and then food grain and uh, the fruit of the field and fruit of trees these are very important and very valuable resources and they are commodities because they are very valuable we need these things, things that uh, are commonly used by everyone to feed themselves, to sustain them, sustain themselves. Those things, building materials, textiles, those are very valuable. You can have gold, but if you don't have someone that sees it as valuable as a thing to trade with or barter with, it's not really all that valuable. <laughs> when you you even look at uh, when the wealth of Abram is described. It said that he was very wealthy in Machne, which is actually um, really live, I, um, just living creatures that are um, possessed by someone, you know, and it could be um, servants, it could be cattle, you know, that's basically that's what Machne covers. And then, that says he also had gold and silver. That wasn't put at the top. And when you consider the fact that those sorts of things have a greater utility, and thus a greater value, than a precious metal in general, because that precious metal will not help you to live. You can't eat it. You can't wear it. You can't build shelter from it. So those things have a far greater utility and value. And if you think those things do, imagine how much utility and value a human has. And then imagine how much utility and value an atomite has. Because I know these people. I know these people at the top. They are... They are parsing and deciding the value of people based on their different racial profile. I promise you they are. That's where the greatest value is. People. People. That's your great resource right there. That's why all of these companies have human resource department. So if you had a kingdom and I don't think this is something that they just learned recently. Just because the fact that there's a lot of people who can show that, uh, you know, when the U.S. Congress made the country bankrupt <clears throat> and sold us into slavery, that they started trading birth certificates on the, op on the open market. Well, not, maybe not the open market, but on the market. Just because they can show that that happened somewhat recently doesn't mean that that's something that they figured out recently. They've known that for a long time. They've known where, where the value is. They've known where power is. You can have all the gold in the world. But if people don't find it as a valuable commodity for trade you're not going to attain the sort of power over people that you want. So I kind of, 
in doing this uh, this study on precious metals and gems, having to think about all this stuff, and then you know all the time, all the time I hear these videos that um, and read books and articles go that go back to Rothschild, right? Go back to Rothschild and um, you know Kuhn Loeb, Schiff, all of those figures. Um, and you know, I guess I sometimes am not sure if I, if I, if I really believe the story about, uh, the coming to power of this great Rothschild dynasty. Um, he was supposed to have come up with this idea just a few centuries ago. Oh, well, what we need to do is because it's dangerous to carry your your precious metals with you and highwaymen or maybe different governments could rob you um, we're going to place a certain amount of precious metals at various locations and allow people to get a note from one location and present it at another and get their gold and that's how they started growing rapidly and then they manipulated the market through the Napoleonic Wars. I don't doubt that very much. But one thing I've I've wondered, and this is this is Rothschild related, but it's it's just related to these international bankers in general. For as long as we can kind of look back, it would appear that these uh, these banker types were keeping like if you read Richard Kelly Hoskins War Cycles Peace Cycles you know it seems to go back a heck of a long ways that that these people these sort of private individuals are keeping these governments like wrapped around their finger um because they have because they have what because they have gold And I'm not necessarily minimizing the fact that that gold may be like a universal trade standard, but everybody at the top, everybody in the halls of power, would know that gold is not nearly as valuable as the human resources they have and the natural resources they have. That's going to actually um, get them a lot more power. I mean, look, National Socialist Germany rebuilt themselves and re-strengthened themselves very, very, very quickly and not on gold. They didn't do it on gold. They didn't do it on gold. They did it by coming up with a system that did not enslave their greatest natural resources that they had or misuse them. I would say it's that and the idea that wealth does not lie in whoever has this, this great amount of gold. People produce so much one person produces so much. That's 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 where a huge amount of wealth is. Um, so much can be gotten from from one one good stable natural resource. It's amazing. No matter what it is, clean water, good soil, having a very decent climate that your country or your kingdom is in the people, the type of people. These all matter, whether people want to get all hurt out there or not. These different things, they matter concerning how these people at the top look at wealth. The reason that they do everything to manipulate people is because that's where the wealth is. So, if you understand that and apply that, 
And you also understand the fact that really most of the people that are very powerful, that are pulling the strings, that want to retain their power, you will never hear their names. You won't even know they exist. But yet they're making out the Rothschilds like they're the end-all be-all. But they're in our face all the time, first off. You know? You have to wonder if they're as much a front, as well as the coon lobes and shift types, if they are as much a front to the, the ideas of the evils of the money system and banking, as much of a front as, say, a Rockefeller is for um, the evils of the oil industry and, and transportation and all that. <clears throat> you know? Now, having said that, so why would they strip the nation of its gold back in, say, the... Uh, you know, the 30s, the U.S. of gold. Well, maybe for one thing, if everybody were to keep trading just on a gold standard, they wouldn't be forced into trading um, their fiat notes that don't pay for debt they discharge a debt you see that's the one way they had to get everybody in line with the uh, universal uh, commercial code the uniform commercial code is through the use of federal reserve notes that discharge debt do not pay debt because you can pay debt with gold and silver it's considered money you know, but did they do that because it's of this great value uh, in some other way that we're not aware of? I'm not too sure, to be honest with you. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't know things that uh, they have cooking that I'm not aware of. I'm not sure. You know, I'm very sure that they're not Anunnaki that are simply mining gold here to take back to their home planet and use it in their stereo systems. But as far as what use they might currently have for it that we don't know about, I'm not sure. Because, you see, if anybody would know the technologies of the ancient world, it's these people. They're the people that haven't forgotten what the ancient world was. They're the people holding the uh, pretty much most of the lost manuscripts. And they're holding all of this, and they understand all of these things, because they are the most um, loathsome, despicable uh, life forms that exist, that I'm aware of. You see, they know how much power it gives them to have people ignorant. Ignorant of anything and everything. Yeah, maybe one of those things that um, they want to keep us ignorant of is maybe how many really true practical very, very practical day-to-day -day uses that gold has. Even uses uh, perhaps in those natural resource areas that we're talking about and clean water, good soil, good weather, um, healthy livestocks um, or raising, processing the, uh, the livestock or, um, sorry, um, you know, grains, fruits, so on and so forth. These, these, these common, these natural resources that everybody needs very much, um, it could have a lot to do with what sort of health benefits in general it has. They know that, and they're hoarding it for that reason. I don't know. I don't know. The unfortunate thing is, in the context of the um, word studies I'm doing, I don't have enough time to check all of the <clears throat> potential uses. Uh, like, for instance, a word like Zeb. Ze Zeb's at the top of the list as far as words that are translated as gold. And um, 
the thing is, it just doesn't have enough comparatives and, and contextual usage uh, to say that, well, I think, b besides the fact that, yeah, it seems to be used as a, a, a common currency, common trade commodity, and um, used for preserving different things, um, you know, wrapping items, because when you do that, then the, the what, whatever is inside will not corrode, so it is preservative in that way. Um, but yeah, when I'm, when I'm done with that, um, I'm hoping to actually, uh, perhaps have, uh, Nathan and Victor on, on my channel so that we can go over some of these things. I would imagine, uh, because of the, the sort of research work that they do, that they might have, um, found a number of, of things uh, out about various perceived precious metals and precious gems and stones and so on um, that I can't. I really only have time to look at this from a, a biblical point of view. And unfortunately, I cannot um, look at every verse under a microscope. But I did want to at least put that question to you about the idea of gold, about the idea of wealth, about the idea of the Rothschilds, and this idea of money, wealth, and power, and the retention of it, because, again, this is just me, look, if they, if they were, were holding so much sway and so much power over these governments, what? Because they had gold. What is to stop a government with a standing army from taking everything that they have? I mean, King Henry VIII did that to the uh, the Catholic Church in England. He just did a massive takeover of all their property. What's to stop? What's to stop a monarch and a nation, one that's strong enough to just doing the same thing? Honestly. Why didn't they they get a hold of, of the other monarchs and say, listen, I know that you are languishing as much under the, the you know, the, the sort of stranglehold that these people have on you and, and their debt system. Let's just go ahead and, and uh, get rid of that and enrich ourselves in the meantime, you know, and, and solve this whole problem. Why didn't they do that? I mean, it would appear that they had the resources to do that. I guess these are just things about the uh, the accepted story that I kind of mull around. I mean, obviously, they're obviously the monarchs of um, these countries were in bed with the tribe for a heck of a long time because they had to adhere to they had to adhere to biblical laws. They couldn't just charge usury. Not until Cohen or Calvin came along and started saying things like, a literal usury is good, but too much is excessive. I mean, I can't even believe I hear people do that today. Mark Collett said that today. He defined usury in one of his videos I listened to recently as excessive interest. It's not true. It's all interest. It's any interest, period, period. Any interest, period. Not excessive. But that's what Calvin said. They had to wait for Calvin to come along and push that through really hard. But before that, they couldn't charge any usury. They couldn't really take the advantage of their people that they wanted to. They knew their people was the value. That's where the wealth is. And they wanted to take more advantage of them than they currently really were allowed. And that's why these monarchs would bring in the tribe. They would bring them in to run private banks, to run pawn shops, to run all kinds of uh, various industries within their country. And they would get a cut from that. That's how they were able to do this. It was almost like how they use the lottery today is the poor tax without you looking directly at the state and saying, why are they screwing me with this? They would do it in the same way. I mean, so anytime you see, um, you know, any 
uh, source from from that tribe that says um, that, that cries about how these certain monarchs would take everything uh, from them when they would kick them out. Well, I certainly am not saying that 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 wasn't the case, but there was definitely mutual uh, agreements. They were working together to fleece the sheep, not their sheep. And yeah, that may have had a lot to do with why no monarchs just ever took advantage of, you know, attacking that money system and saying, well, I've had enough. I've had enough of, of this, um, this predatory money system. You know, I'm just having a real hard time. And please, you know, if you have some more insight on it, you know, feel free, please comment. Um, but, um, really how somebody who's supposed to be a private individual could have so much sway over a government just by what? By what? Their ability to lend gold? I just would think that for a much longer time, the people at the top, so monarchs and these, you know, the intelligent, well, higher than the intelligentsia, basically the people that were old money, besides the monarchs, so, um, you know, your uh, quote-unquote royalty, and then uh, the big money people, the merchants of the earth, her princes were the merchants of the earth. They would know this. They know where the, the greatest value is in resources. They know it. For a fact. So, kings would know that. Royalty, so called, would know that. And, you know, and then these money powers, these international merchants, would know that. So, then what, what's the deal with gold? Because they would all know that's not the most valuable resource and commodity. They, would, they all would know. So that idea is what's kind of bothering me as I'm doing this study and trying to determine some of these things. It's a real, really, really nagging me. So again, please, you can contact me at uh, Obery Project with a K dot info. Uh, you can go to the website, and there's a way to contact me about the bottom of every page. If you are willing to chip in and do something good for the cause of bringing uh, the kingdom, um, and we all just do what we can. The problem is there's far too much to do, and I can't do it all. I've got way, way, way too much going on. Um, but everybody needs to chip in, no matter what it is. Everybody should chip in. What I said at the end of that, uh, what I said at the end of that recording that I did with uh, with Victor and Nathan on on Saturday, I'm absolutely 100% standing behind that. The 80/20 rule has got to stop. We cannot survive any longer working off the 80/20 rule. And the thing is, you know, most of the people that are going to want to volunteer their time are the same kind of people that volunteer their money because they are the 20. And it's really not 80, 20. It's usually 90, 10 or even worse. It, it can't work anymore. That cannot work anymore. We're going to have to learn to work together better. And everybody is going to have to pitch in or I think most of you know what the alternatives are that we're looking at. So I hope you guys will consider that. I hope I'll hear from some people that are, are willing to, uh, to, to help. It's not serious, severe work. It's, it's relatively simple. It's just a bit time consuming, you know? So, all right, everybody. I do hope you all have a really good day. And uh, we'll see you next time.